Hello, welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. If you're coming to this video from the last video we did today, you'll notice my hat is still off because for some reason I have decided to stick with continuity between my episodes for today. Uh, we're going to be checking out a special selection, which is where one of you tell me what I need to check out. Today's comes from today's comes from Autumn Sphere. It says filthy and catchy technical death thrash, Ouroboros Panacea. So let's dive into this, see what's going on with this. I don't recognize the band name aside from, you know, the actual word. Uh, I don't know if we've checked them out before, but I do see they're from Australia. I know they're death metal, technical death metal. Let's just dive in and see where they're going to take us today. I like the shift between the more uh, the muted runs with the less muted runs. They're not really open. Oh, a little bit of a shift there. Was that tempo? Yeah, I think it was. Another one. Yeah, nice little shift towards dotted there. Oh man, those toms. Oh, dude, dude, they're just so big. Especially compared to the super tight face kicks. Really nice to get that little uh, melodic moment against all this rhythmic textural stuff. Unceremoniously move to this section from the solo. It kind of ended abruptly. Oh, I say solo. I guess it was a duet. Here's the solo.
straightforward track uh, majority of the sections have ooh, what is that I don't know if it's 16th or 32nd notes they move so quickly uh, on the guitars the bass uh, the bass kicks we have slower moving growls on top of it and we have one deviation from it in our duet, which gets reutilized um, after a, a breakdown. Is that what we're going to call that section? Where it's just that one note and they just hit it rhythmically. I think these are 16th notes then. 16th notes at a fast tempo though. Yeah. Um, there are some really neat riffs in here. But they're always used to transition back into, uh, is it chugging? Is that what we call it? When they pick one note and do rhythmic stuff on it? I don't know if that's the proper term for it. A lot of this ends up being kind of pedal tone uh, rhythmic stuff, which is fine. It sounds cool. It's got a nice groove to it. It's catchy. Um, there's just something about it that doesn't quite work for me all the time. And it's weird because, like, we have listened to some older thrashier stuff, right? We've listened to old Megadeth, and they they do this uh, occasionally. Um, you know, I've talked about in the past that I've listened to a lot of older Metallica, and they sometimes get into some chuggy things, too. But I don't know if it's nostalgia in those cases or not. I do know when I listen to new music, not newly released music, but new to my ears... I don't typically enjoy pedal note writing. And uh, that's that's what happens here a lot. So it's sort of 50-50 for my personal enjoyment on this one where I enjoy some of the more technical melodic lines, some of the riffs that we get at the end of phrases. But there's a lot of stuff like the breakdown. It's definitely the breakdown just completely lost all impact on me which was interesting and we will get to this because that whole bridge section was unexpected <laughs> i was gonna say weird but i think i wanted to go a little bit more of a neutral term there it was unexpected not what i would have done and not what i expected them to do so let's uh let's dive into this we get our um we open the track out Lots of energy right out the gate, right? And we, we get right into this really quick playing. And the thing I want to point out, and, you know, old time, long time viewers of the channel, they're probably going to get tired of me saying this, but, you know, if, if you've never watched my videos before, this is definitely something that needs to be pointed out about this band is just how tight they're playing. The do-do-do, do-do-do, just these really tight groupings of notes and you can hear where the note hits where it stops and where the next one begins and the thing is is you've got at least one guitarist probably two guitarists i'm going to assume a bass and a bass drum in most of these sections all leaning into this exact same pattern and rhythm and for you to be able to hear the space between the notes means that they all need to start and stop at the exact same time it is very very easy for this run to lose that crispness and actually become a bit muddied and it doesn't even need to be a lot a bit muddied you know we are humans we <laughs> to play at this level consistently is mind-boggling to have that synergy and perfection in performance 
of always landing each of those notes at the exact same time and having the same spacing between them, not just for yourself, which you could easily create just a hair bit of weighting to it where maybe this one leans over just a fraction of a second, which means you start your next one a fraction of a second later, and maybe uh, you know the next two get slightly delayed out of this as well. It's not gonna be something anybody notices, but when you stack it up against somebody who comes in just a hair early, and someone else who's playing perfectly, and someone else who comes in just a hair late, but maybe a bit later than you did, you've got something that doesn't have that crisp attack to it. And so when we get a studio recording like this, you definitely have the help of post-production to it, but I'm going to assume that they sound similar live. Uh, and some of it's gonna be up to the engineer, some of it's gonna be up to your guitar tones. You notice that they don't have super wide fuzzy tones, they have more directed tones, and it really helps lean into this, uh, this crisp sound. But I'd, I'd wager they can still get really close to this live. And then you just got to think about the sheer um, endurance of doing this, of staying so in sync with the rest of your band and being so on time for each of these pockets. There must have been 150 of these little tight pockets of five to seven notes back to back. You got to do that 100 times in this song and then 100 times in every song after it for... You know what, figure 30, 40, 50 minute set, depending if you're uh, headlining or not. It just, it's fascinating. Not just thinking that people would write this, but that they would write it for themselves to perform. <laughs> thinking about that, there's a little bit of a masochistic element to there, isn't it? Uh, maybe not. It just... I would never write something like this for myself because, again, just the sheer endurance of doing it live. One recording is a totally different thing from night after night after night of hour long pushing your, your body like that. So anyways, we have our opening note that's filled with this. Really quick runs, uh, sitting on a note, really quick runs, rising up and down notes, having a little bit of a melodic element and bouncing back and forth between these. Um, one thing I pointed out here that I really enjoyed was the fact that we had these super palm muted elements and then we had, we kind of traded them off. We would do a bar of palm muted with uh, just super short attacks and then we'd have one a little bit more legato where the notes kind of flow into each other but just due to how quick we're picking, it still has sort of that sharp accented feel to it. But the notes aren't abruptly stopped after each attack. So we kind of have this muted element versus a legato element. We bounce back and forth on that. Really nice way to add a little bit of contrast to the verse where th musically, unless you can, unless you have the sheet music in front of you and you're seeing how the notes are shifting, it kind of just feels like pedal tone, melody, pedal tone, melody, and it kind of gets a little bit repetitive. But when you can uh, shape this up and shift it around a little bit, with changing between palm muted and not muted, you uh, you get a lot more variety out of the sonic quality of your riff. Really neat way of doing this. Um, the growls, I gotta talk about the growls just because they feel out of place. And I think this is gonna tie into kind of the whole thing as production. The growls aren't really present, but they don't feel like they're stuffed into the band like death metal does. Kind of buries the vocals into the mix instead of elevates them like what we would hear in pop or something more mainstream. They feel a bit more elevated, like they should have the spotlight, but they're difficult to hear. And I think some of that's just going to be the range. Um, there's also a almost a raw element to them. I think I'm so used to having a ton of production on harsh vocals that when I hear something like this that sounds very close to just raw sound coming into a microphone, it almost sounds anemic. It sounds like it needs width or a boost of some sort, even though this is pretty close to what the dudes just doing it should be fine we I shouldn't expect all the extraness to it 
but we do hear a lot of processed and i, I i'm gonna say processed vocals people are like no there's nothing like that in metal no everything gets tweaked right whether it's metal or pop or hip-hop or mainstream or obscure there's very few genres that don't tweak input uh, audio somehow whether it's just you know a little bit of compressing a little bit of width and a little bit of eq i'm not talking about auto tuning over here i'm just talking about touching a sound up it happens in everything um, and I'm so used to those little touch-ups on harsh vocals, and they're not really here. And the other thing, too, I think, is that we have a single track on the vocals rather than a double track. So it's going to lose some of that width there as well. Um, and it, it ends up feeling, like I said, a bit anemic. And it kind of pulls me into the overall production of this, which feels a bit lackluster to what I expect. And, you know, I'm coming off of this from Dillinger Escape Plan, which I'm not going to say has fantastic production, but it is a big production. Every inch of the sound sphere is filled up on that track we just listened to. And I, I came from that to here and I probably should have some sort of palate cleanser. I don't know how to do an audio palate cleanser between reactions, but... I mean, it's just clear as day how much space is in this track, which feels weird for how heavy and aggressive it is. And some of that space is just going to be the clarity. Like I mentioned, we can't have a ton of distortion and widths to these guitars because it's going to really mess with the sound of these really quick attacks. So the growls really need to bring that width to the table, and they don't here. They're a bit more of a, a raw single track style where it's a lot closer to what this person is probably actually making uh, with their with their throat and their, their mouth and all that. Um, and it's it's just the song kind of feels like it's lacking that punch to me. Which is weird because musically it's not. The sound of the guitars, the growling feel like they should be bigger. They should be taking up a lot of space and they aren't. But what it does lend itself into is a very clean production, which allows me to appreciate a lot of the musicality in this. So I wonder if this is a balancing act for this band and or their engineer. You know, I don't know how closely they worked with the, the production side of it. But it is a song or a style of music that demands a sort of clarity. And I am happier as a critical listener, having all of this space to listen to all the finer details in the track, but it does, at least to me, take away from a little bit of the punch that would help it stand out as a metal song, you know, to have that extra oomph in it. And I think some of that comes down to the, the vocals. I think if the vocals were a little wider, I wouldn't feel it as much. Or maybe even just double tracked. But that would take away from some of the cleanliness or clarity of the vocals as well, which I appreciated there too. I got to hear some of the unique sounds rather than just the white noise, the, the crackle of the growl, I actually got to hear some really cool characteristics of it. It was uh, a growl style technique that I hadn't heard before. It's still that low end, <sighs> that, that low end growly stuff. But uh, yeah, it just had character to it. So again, I enjoyed the production on this critically, but casually I think uh, I found it a little lackluster. Now, all of this takes us into the bridge, which was really neat. Again, on paper, I think this works well. Um, we come out of a vocal section and we introduce two melodic guitars. I love the contrast here. First of all, we got really nice harmony between them. We got to hold out notes. I think there was still a moving, faster played guitar line under this. I know there was during the solo. I can't remember specifically if there was during this duet. Um, so we still had some of that drive though, I think. But Importantly, we had these long held out melodic lines that really allowed us to enjoy some of the dyads that they have been creating this whole time that at least my ear can't pick up on because they're moving so quickly. And really getting to spend a little bit of time with these two notes that our, our guitars are... Actually, we never had dyads prior to this, do we? 
I think there were a couple of those end of phrase runs that were harmonized, but most of the time the guitars were playing the same notes, weren't they? Yeah. So anyways, if they had decided to play these harmonies faster, I wouldn't have been able to appreciate the, the characteristics that these dyads were creating uh, and bringing to the table, and they were really cool. And not only that, it gave me a bit of a, a moment to breathe. We have all this fast-paced, moving action going on through this track. We take a moment to just relax and calm. Like I said, there, I think there's still a moving element underneath, but you're paying attention to these two guitars and just these suspended notes, and it is just a nice moment to, to recuperate because we're going to get back into that really fast technical stuff in a second. And we do, unceremoniously, I stated. The solo, or the duet, just kind of ends. I don't think, I don't even think the melodic element resolved itself in any way. It just They just sort of stopped playing at one point. It never felt like an ending. And we went into this pedal tone breakdown. One note and a, and a rhythmic pattern for like 30 bars or something. Uh, not my favorite part of the track, as I explained earlier. I'm uh, breakdowns, man. <laughs> I don't care if it's a deathcore breakdown or a thrashy breakdown or a death breakdown. You sit on one note, you're going to lose my attention. <laughs> you got to do something other than that. I understand the point of breakdowns, so though. I can appreciate them from a distance. Just not my cup of tea casually. And maybe when we get into the lyrics and I recognize, oh, this is probably during the breakdown point. Maybe I can make a correlation there. But this genre of music, just they tend to have breakdowns. That's just like a staple of it. So I wouldn't be surprised if it was just done because that's what you do with this type of music. And not because the lyrical content or the story of the song was demanding it. What was interesting, though, is that we came out of this and went back to our harmony. Shorter lived into a fast solo. And this was really cool, too, because not only did we get to hear our two guitars not playing super quickly, but engaging in melodic elements, we also got to shift it and see the midpoint of this. What if we did melody while we played quickly and we didn't play around with pedal notes too often. We just stuck with the runs, with the riffs. Um, so we got to hear like pure technical, pure melody, technical melody. Really nice way to bring this in. Um, and then we wrapped up the song. So the bridge, this whole bridge, the, the, the melody, sorry, the duet, the breakdown, the duet, the solo works beautifully on paper. Um, just that transition out of the first melody felt a bit strange to me, and I'm not sure why. I, I honestly kind of think it might have been a production thing too. The breakdown might have had more impact if it was a grittier production possibly. I, I don't know. Um, it, this was another point in the song where I felt it was just a bit weak to my ears and and I'll maybe, maybe I don't know I don't want to I don't want to harp on the production anymore I think I've said my piece the last thing we got to talk about real quick before you hit lyrics is times no tempo we were in 4-4 the whole time definitely don't need time signature tempo this band decides to shift gears on the fly and just you as a listener have to deal with it and I think it kind of works here. I'm not quite sure what makes me feel that way. Usually these sharp transitions without any lead in are a bit abrasive to my ears. I'm not a big fan of them, but they worked here. We'll just be in one idea and then we'll shift to a, a new riff, but the new riff is at a slower tempo and you just kind of got to move with it. And it worked. We did it uh, twice, I think. We had three different tempos. Oh, no. The uh, the bridge was a new one, too. So we did it three times. We had four different tempos on this. Um, and it's just, it's a technical thing, right? You go into tech death and you got to deal with stuff like this. It happens. Uh, all right, I'm going to hit some lyrics here. Uh, I know I didn't have much to say on that, but... I had to point it out. It was a pretty pretty big deal, at least in the, the first half of this track. So let's hit some lyrics and see what's going on there. 
All right, this is uh, it's a heavy topic. I don't think this is a tough a tough call for me. I don't think the music did the weight of the topic justice. But I don't know if you can, if your primary mode of composition, at least to my ears, is rule of cool. What sounds cool? A lot of the riffs in here sound cool, but they don't really carry a thematic weight to them. The song is about going to war. Watching, uh, well, the narrator says my brother. I'm not sure if this is a... Uh, like a brother in arms, or if this is legit a biological brother, it really doesn't matter. But uh, about watching a brother get wounded and knowing that there's no chance for them to survive, but that they're not dead yet. The big moment in the song where we say the title says, powerless am I to make you whole once again. And he screams panacea. Panacea is a, a cure-all. It's, uh, it's, it's something that can heal all ailments. Uh, and he basically wants to be this perfect remedy that can, uh, you know, get rid of the pain and heal the wounds and all that of this friend or brother, or, you know, whatever. And can't and feels that sadness and that empathy and puts themselves in this person's shoes knowing the pain they're in and that there's no chance for survival at one point says even the gods on high refuse to let my brother die but the responsibility has now been thrust on me as this person lying on the ground next to him says, please send me on my way and release me from this pain. He says, and now I shall bear, bear the burden of fratricide. Fratricide, let me pronounce that properly, to end your suffering. Like this is a, a painful, heavy topic about the realities of war. Oh, actually, I think it is um, a biological brother because the very first line says we grew as one through infancy. Just saying that we were like super close as we grew up, right? We were inseparable through maturity. So yeah, they've been together all their lives. They've always had each other's backs. Now they're at war together and Shrapnel has just torn his brother to shreds and he's got to put his own brother out of his misery. Heavy topic. I did not get any of that from the music, though. The music is just a rip-roaring good time. The closest analogy I could say is that the repeated use of the heavy, quick pedal tones mimics that of gunfire, um, automatic weapons, but it's not something I... It's, it's like a one-off, especially since I'm going to assume a lot of their music is like this being a tech death band. It would be more of a coincidence that the themes could be layered that way, more so than an intentional crafting of the music. And that doesn't diminish its application here. But it does diminish my ability to read it as that theme, especially on a first listen. Hmm. It's always tough on me <laughs> when I'm when I'm going through the music and talking about how awesome it sounds and how gritty it sounds. I'm I'm, I'm kind of happy I didn't use the term brutal on any referring to any of the riffs this time around. That is a phrase I would use for well similar guitar riffs as this. Uh, I think it really is the production that kept me from using that term. Funny enough. Uh, but, you know, we talk about how awesome the guitar work is, the drumming and, you know, all that. And then we get to the topic. I'm like, wow, I just talked about how awesome this song was. And it's about having to kill your brother because, you know, he's in such pain. 
<laughs> Those are my thoughts on Ouroboros' Panacea. Uh, what do you all think? Anything you want to share or add on to what I said or anything like that, let me know down in the comments. Above the comment section is a description box. In there is a link for Linktree. It takes you to this menu here. It has links for everything related to the channel. You can find multiple ways to support the channel. A link to my music, a link to the Discord server, and so much more. Sorry. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three. All right, that wraps it up for today. I'll be back tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 p.m. UTC, as always. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos. Mm -hmm.